We are live. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Literary Roadhouse Book Club. Today, we're discussing Black Leopard, Red Wolf by Marlon James. I'm Anais, joined by Gerald Hornsby and Colette Sartor. Hey, guys. Hey. Hello. Hi. I'm so glad we're all here okay. since we've been very passionate about this story in Slack um, <laughs> and not always for the good. Well. Yeah. So let's start as we no. always do with our overall impressions. Um, Gerald, do you want to kick us off? <laughs> do you want to, do you want to kick us yeah. <laughs> That was mean. Um, okay. I, 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 I know we're going to get in, in, into the negative later. So so our, our, the positive aspects of it, um, it's a great idea for a story. Um, some of his writing I find quite funny and entertaining and quite witty. Um, there's some... some there's some clever dialogue in there. Um, and yeah, and the rest is all negative, I'm afraid. Sorry. Yeah, but can you give a high level version of why negative, just like in a sentence? Um, um, gratuitous violence, lots of gratuitous violence, lots of gratuitous rape, violent sex. Um, he, I, I think, and I've got, a, I've got a theory that once you've won a Booker Prize or a big prize, then you are impervious to edits and editors. So, so it's a huge book and it goes on and on and on. And I, I just think there's so much wasted, so many wasted words in this that, that could have been cut. But uh, so, yeah, so <laughs> apart from that, it was fine. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I did appreciate there were, the, I love the world building. I'm always appreciative of world building. Uh, there were times that I loved Tracker. I loved Tracker's relationship to children. Um, and there was that part of him that I found very endearing. Um, but <laughs> the, and, and, you know, I, I, I echo everything Gerald said, and I would add in terms of what he didn't like, and I would add that the circular storytelling, you know, the the resistance to allowing the readers this great narrative drive of it's like, it should be a road story, right? And it should be, there should be this really strong narrative drive where he can hang the complexities off of that one plot line that just keeps us moving forward and keeps everything tense and he resists it for no apparent reason and i just got impatient the the repetitiveness without point especially of the gratuitous violence and the the, the violence against children and the rapes and it, it got boring i can't believe i'm saying that about this action and adventure you know uh, other world but it did mm, yeah yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely. I your point, yeah, your point about the, the circular narrative, I, I had that hadn't occurred to me, but but because I was so angry with the, the book, but but you're absolutely right because a, a great sort of hero's journey or a road trip story has has an end in sight, and the the tension gets bigger and bigger as you go along. So so the the jeopardy increases. And and the stakes increase, so you, you sort of it, it, there's like this this rolling thing, but but it, it's like you know he visits a sort of place, and and then he comes out and he goes and visits another place, and there's sort of yes, we know what the end is because he he spoils that right at the start, um, but actually that that's not too bad, but but it's sort of yeah, it, it, you sort of lose that you lose that drive as the reader and and you just go here we go again there's another little story and and it's yeah mm -hmm. yeah it doesn't work like that Sorry, yeah nice. yeah so it, you know in the in the pre-show i was talking through the plot lines with you guys and gerald made the comment of you know that when i'm saying it it sounds really cool because i'm not mentioning all the sexual violence stuff so when you when you take away the gratuitous violence there's a cool story here and it's dressed up with just cool mythological creatures and awesome world building and, you know, a, a, a diverse cast of characters. At its core, there is a good 
road story here that is trying to defy uh, a clean narrative, which we'll get into a little bit later. James talks about that in an interview, and it's interesting. But then there's all of this gratuitous sexual violence, violence in general, and feces and piss <laughs> and just gross stuff everywhere that mm. makes it difficult to get to the beautiful parts, right? Like one of the things I was talking about in the pre-show with um, Colette is when you learn how Nika becomes the Pumdulu, spoilers for anyone listening to this, when you learn about that, um, how he got there in terms of plot is quite beautiful. But then the details of exactly how it happened just made me mad. And that was my experience with the story the entire time. Like the actual plot, the things that are resonating, the things that are coming back are quite beautiful, but I'm mad all the time. So with that said, let's focus on the parts. <laughs> with that said. With that said, <laughs> let's focus first on the parts that we thought were beautiful and let's leave the rants for the end because as you guys know, I got some long ones. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I'm so mad about some things. Um yeah yeah so we already talked a little bit about the things that we like um and how hard it was to draw on what is the story actually about but you can sort of pick up on what it's about so what do you guys think it's about what are like the recurring themes or motifs that you spotted throughout the story um wow um don't know collect but um i I mean, Tracker is almost an anti-hero. <laughs> well, he is an anti-hero. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it's it's definitely one of the themes that recurs and recurs and recurs is people getting rejected because of their sexuality. Mm -hmm. And that I really appreciated. And finding each other because of their sexuality. And I actually thought, thought there was a really wonderful story in there about um gay men and how they come together or, or you know and how they come together and fall apart and then finally allow themselves to fall in love and accept each other in a way that no one else has ever accepted them and i thought that was a really beautiful storyline and funny he made he's funny i mean james is really really funny his dialogue is fabulous and there's also that sense of not belonging as you know i loved the very beginning the story of tracker's own family and who his father turned out to be and who he's supposed to avenge and and how he wanted none of that and how the family you're it's almost as if the family you're born into isn't the family that has to be yours because we see by the end he has built his own family with these children who he, he just can't get out of his mind who i couldn't get out of his, my mind and he's actually entered into this beautiful love affair so you've got that storyline going that that I loved, you know, and that kept getting lost for me. Yep. Yeah, I'd agree with that. The Mosi Tracker love story was fantastic. Um, yeah. And it's like the first time we see enthusiastic, consensual, loving sex. And it's beautifully drawn. It didn't feel like oh it's beautifully it written. Grown. It wasn't gross, right? It was great. No, it was, it was sensual. Lovely. It was beautiful. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. James, do more of that. <laughs> you can write consensual loving sex. That's still, you know, no <laughs> detail spared, but is nice, is enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think one of the other themes and motifs that came up a lot was, uh, and Tracker asks it all the time, which is what is truth? What is truth, right? What is truth? Yes. Um, there's a thing about storytelling throughout where like people constantly want stories and you see it more towards the end which is when um the inquisitor is asking tracker in jail uh the story about what happened to me too all those years that whole section it's not tracker telling it tracker never tells the inquisitor um about the family he built with mosi and me too um instead it's a griot that they had captured who had been sort of following uh, Mosi and Tracker and lived with them who wrote an entire song about their love affair and their family. So that whole section is sung by a griot that Tracker doesn't want to tell because it's very painful for him because they all die. But um, so there's a way in which there's a lot of storytelling or later in the jungle when Tracker is hunting the Sasambonsam and the child for his final revenge. Uh, he's always driven by revenge, right? His final one. Right. Um, 
he runs into this creepy version of Spider-Man. It's like this like white scientist who had experimented. Okay, but again, gross. So he like can shoot out webs from his penis. There's a lot of penis stuff, which we'll I guess <laughs> get into. But so like there's this like Spider-Man who was rejected, as you were saying, there was a theme of rejection by the other white scientist. He was considered simple-minded and he figured out a way to become like part spider. And what does he want from Tracker? He wants a story. He's like, tell me a story. Um, so that's constantly happening. Like uh, before Tracker even talks about the story of the child, the first part is let me tell you three other stories first about a leopard, about my family and the coup, right? Like he tells all about yeah. the time it went underground and you know, slept with the river witch to get passage, to get a king out of the underworld. Like he has to tell other stories all the time. And there's never a direct narrative link between all of these things. Um, so that was an interesting theme that kept coming back because it never really, to me, it didn't feel necessary. I enjoyed all those stories. It was almost kind of like short story anthologies in the beginning, to be honest, mm. right? Before you get to the road trip. Um, yeah. And James talks about that in an interview he did in the New Yorker with Gia Tolentino, yeah, who I love. I, I read, read that. All the time. Yeah, me too. Yeah, and um, he talks about how with Tolkien, you never doubt what you're being told, and he's pushing back against that. In his story, you're constantly doubting what you're being told. There's no narrator more unreliable than the Tracker, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I like that. I like the play with truth and storytelling. I did too. I thought that was great, and I actually love and. I love a story where, okay, I'm going to tell you this story, but let me tell you these other stories because it enriches the world. And that's something I really appreciated. And when I first started, well, and I, quite frankly, this book I think is one for me that I needed to listen to. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that pre-show, but in listening to the story, I got a, even more of an, appre an appreciation for those stories within stories that play with truth and that play with our um, the, the reliability, our, our doubt in the reliability of the narrative. And that was fun. I always appreciate that. It's the other elements that maybe not. Yes, it's quite yeah. interesting that, that you, you, you both listen to the audio book of this predominantly. Um, and 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 I didn't do that. I, I read the book, and and I wonder if if listening to it being read would have been better, would have been more enjoyable, and maybe brought me into the story more than 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 reading the words. Because I I will admit I I skim read uh, some of it, and uh, because I just thought, oh, here we go again. You just and and there's a miss some important points or some interesting features or some some clever writing so i i just sometimes think maybe an audiobook is is a better way because you then you get everything you will always get everything i really like this audiobook though uh i did listen to it because when i was reading it i hadn't yet learned the syntax so we'll talk about it in a bit too the way that um james plays with language he plays with the grammar i hadn't yet learned it and it didn't sound right in my head is the best way to put it. And also just the names in this, this world is so foreign that to have a sort of like, to have a, the, the voice actor who's directed by someone who's close to the work, give it to me in the way that is closer to what the world should sound like was very, I mean, I thought, I thought the voice actor did a great job. Um, oh, phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. Like the way that he inflected things, the voices he did, like I could hear the difference in leopards versus Mo Moses versus trackers versus set over voices. Yep. Um, he did a fantastic job with that. And the, the way that he would say, this is some bone song. Like, I'm like, Oh yes. Like he really brought these creatures yeah. to life. <laughs> he did. It was, it was brilliant. I really, the world didn't come because I started out reading this and I got only because I, I, this is the first audiobook I've ever listened to. I don't, I don't re listen to audiobooks. I thought, you know, I'm going to try it this way. And it worked so much better for me. The book came alive. It really yeah. did in a way that I'm like, oh, this is why people like audiobooks because this feels like a different book to me. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. You know, and, and I really did appreciate that. Mm. Mm. Interesting. So there was this really large cast of characters with James is like, known for i think what is it the history of a seven killings that's like 76 named characters in the beginning he, he does that a lot like a lot of characters um 
So how does he draw them and bring them to life? Because for me, at least, they all felt, felt very, very distinct, even though there were so many of them. Um, yeah, how did you guys think about his like character drawing? Um, yeah, it, 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 I, I just, just when I was reading it, I, I, I'm just constantly amazed by how much work he's put into this. Um, it's it's yes it's physically a huge tome it's a lot of words it's a long story but but the characters are all well individually drawn and separated so you could you you got a feeling for what the characters were um uh, and how they operated and and each was was separate to to the other so i i think and and i was just just thought he either he's some super genius who, who can have all these these characters beautifully defined in his head or he he's just got a massive wall somewhere with all the characters on and the whole story um because it's it, it is an you know an impressive piece of writing mm. yeah I well, and add? yeah i i agree and the visuals yeah the visuals are so fabulous you know, um, especially again, I, I felt a real affinity to the children who wind up being his family and even smoke girl. Who's not, I mean, she, she's smoke. And yet I could, I had a visual representation of what she was in front of my, you know, in, in my, in my head the whole time. So I feel like his descriptive descriptions are masterful. Mm -hmm. Um, and I always have a hard time. I'm not very good with names. I'm not good at remembering people's names. Um, I have to work really hard at names. So I remember very few of the names in the book, to be honest, but the key figures, he found a way to make me remember their names, like to pair, like I've, I've paired the visual with the names. Um, and if I can't remember someone's just give me a few words of who they were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You cut out a little I, bit there. Oh, she's I know out. who that character is. is he, he, he's really good with description. <clears throat> Can I lower her bandwidth? you know, really incorporating a trait to the character. So a brilliant writer. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Colette, you were cutting out a lot there. Could you go into your settings and take your bandwidth down? Sure. <clears throat> yeah. Settings in Google Hangout, Yeah, right? so just take care. Yep, in Google Hangout, right, there's a place so... we can adjust bandwidth and just, it's, pro it's probably on auto HD, just slide it down a bit. So it's not right, demanding as much from your bandwidth. All right. Let me see where It's not in is. settings. It's next to settings. There's like, it looks like the reception bars. It's a that oh, thing yeah. next to the gear to the left. There we go. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. That's all the way up. Yeah. So just so take I'm it down. down a bit. Medium? Mm -hmm. Low? Yeah. Okay. I'm at Medium, low. yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll see how that does. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. So I agree um, with what you guys were saying about the way that he draws these characters and keeps them on his head. Um, so who was your favorite and who was your least favorite? Hmm. There's such a wide choice for least favorite. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's go with favorite. Hmm. Honestly, Smoke Girl was my favorite. Mm. You know, there's something, the fact that she loved him so much uh, she loved trackers so much. She followed it just, yeah, there was something in there. I think part of the reason smoke girl was my favorite was because she humanized tracker mm -hmm. in a way that he needed to be humanized. Yeah. 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 And mostly, and, and mostly, mostly is my favorite by a lot. Yeah. Mostly is just, yeah. mostly is a given like most, yeah. most, mostly is the, I think the best character in the book. 
Yeah. And early on, yeah. there was uh, Bibi, the like servant of Amadou, the slave trader, who wasn't actually a servant, was actually a guard, but everyone ignores servants. So he pretended to be a servant. So Bibi, I liked where Bibi was going, and then he gets killed so early on. I was very irritated. I was like into Bibi's story, and then he just <laughs> dies. <sighs> Which, trait of a good character, if we, we get pissed when they die. Yeah, true. Uh, exactly. I'll, just, I'll say that. Yep, that is a trait of a good character. Hmm. I'm mad that he's dead. I bet then again, by the end of the story, everyone's dead except Tracker and the ISC. So, you know, not really. <laughs> <laughs> not really what you can do. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and for my least favorite, I don't think I had a least favorite in terms of I didn't like that character. Actually, probably the character of the Fellowship who I liked the least who annoyed me the most was probably Tracker. Yeah. He was so annoying. <laughs> like, he, there was parts of him that were endearing, but... He was just always working against his own interests. He was so stubborn and mouthy sometimes that it was just like hard to root for him. Um, but the character that I feel was done the greatest disservice was Sogolan. Like the Moon Witch. I feel like there's a real problem with the way that the women characters are drawn in the story. Because Sogolan has been surviving. No one knows her age. She's like centuries old, maybe. Yeah. She's supposed to be all powerful. And then she does the stupidest thing which is like trade her ragtag group of murderous men into sexual slavery in Dilingo so she can get safe passage with a boy she hasn't even found yet into the Mueru. Like, really? It's so dumb. It's so dumb for a character who's supposed to be so cunning. Or yeah. like um, uh, Lisi Solo, the king's sister. She is supposed to be somebody who is so savvy and wise. Her own father kind of secretly wished that she would be the heir over her own brother, didn't send her to the nunnery because she was like that valuable. She was like a good like strategist. But then like when she sees where her boy has become being raised by monsters, she's still like, I'm going to stick to plan A. <laughs> like, <laughs> really? Like, how is she so dumb? How is she so dumb? Like, well, it's just... Yeah. Ugh. It's really interesting. There is a point um, when Mosi actually says to Tracker, you don't like women. Mm -hmm. You know, why don't you like women? And, you know, it's, you kind of want to say to James, yeah, why does no one like women in this book? <laughs> yeah, why? Yeah. And here's the yeah. thing, in the, in the Gia Tolentino interview, oh, she mentions how she had read an early galley of it and um, later, James sent her a new one saying, hey, it's been updated. I got some feedback that it was very sexist, so this one should be like a little like better. And Gia says the only change she saw was mostly saying that line. Like that's that's the really? change. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Instead of like actually making wow. Sogolan and Lisi, and, uh, Lisi Solo make smart decisions, everyone's an idiot. And then like the Sangoma. Why does Tracker hate the Sangoma? She protects him from iron and spells. She gives him the ability to open magical doors. She believes in him in a way that uh, no one else had at that point. She gives him the wolf eye when his eye is taken away from him by the Bultungi hyena women, right? Which was super cool. Super cool, right? Here's like the Sangoma saving the Mingi children. The only reason he's connected to the Mingi children is because of the Sangoma. He just hates her for no reason other than she is a woman. Like seriously, like the Sangoma is yeah. MVP of his life and he can't see that. No, dude, at all, dude. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like you know, it would help if you actually used that eye for good. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And th like, that's the thing. But then it just you know, when stuff like that happens, there's so many things in here that make me trust the writer, right? The author because he's so smart. When stuff like that happens, it's yeah. like, is this something where because it's be all being told by tracker? I'm supposed to realize Tracker has an issue with women because he can't do the Sangoma or has James also missed this? Like I can't tell. Well, and here's, here's the when problem. It women, yeah. Well, what I was going to say when it comes to women, the problem is that, okay, when you've got an author who's creating an unreliable narrator, that author builds in checkpoints mm -hmm. for the reader outside of the narrator, things that the narrator doesn't see, but somehow creates checks and balances. So there are other characters making observations, like the Mosi co comment. Right. Like there, there are lots of those things where there's a balance so that we see maybe that this female character is actually doing the right thing, but through Tracker's characterization, he can't see beyond his own 
you know, opinions about women. Mm -hmm. There are very, there are few to no checks and balances in this book when it comes to women yeah. and, and the sexist betrayal, you know, portrayal, excuse me, betrayal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so there are very few checks and balances so that that's what makes it, that's what makes me say, eh. And it also feels very, for such a phenomenal writer, for him to create female characters who are supposed to be so brilliant and then wind up making such poor choices, I start saying to myself, I don't just doubt the portrayal, I also doubt the author and I say, okay, that's you're doing that to make something happen as opposed to having the character do something that's true to what she'd actually do. Mm -hmm. You know, so I really feel the authorial hand and I'm disappointed because to me, that's just, that's poor characterization. That's poor writing, yeah. you know, and that's not him. So that's what makes me err on the side of saying, no, that's a blind spot for James. It really, and especially now that you reminded me about the interview and when he's like, when she said, you know, really the only difference I saw was, Mossy's observation of you, yeah. <laughs> of, of you, excuse me, of Tracker. Right, yeah. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's quite an interesting point, isn't it? That that when you are an author of a particular gender, can you can you write? Well, of course you can. You can write yeah. good characters of either gender or of no gender, or creatures or, or anything. You, you can do that, and 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 when you see something like this in a book that is starts to be you sort of notice it and then it starts to become more and more obvious and then you have to start questioning the author and and, and saying do you have a problem with women you know with <laughs> smart women or or you know you just it just sort of at the back of your mind you think hmm maybe you do and like in the interview you learn like james his lifelong best friend is a woman and you know like it's you know it's interesting you bring up that point because i had read something about like authors writing the other gender and there's like there's a lot of women authors who no one criticizes for drawing bad men but there's a lot of men who can't draw women and it's a point of view of have you been forced to consider that like women have been trained their entire lives to constantly consider the emotions and feelings of men and manage them but it doesn't actually go in the other direction it was a very interesting critical essay about that like how come not as many women authors are criticized for drawing bad men but men authors a lot of them are criticized for drawing women poorly and then there's exceptions like people always champion Tennessee Williams as a male author who writes women brilliantly. But then when you read his biography, you see why that is. You see how he was forced to sympathize with women in a way that maybe a lot of men um, uh, don't normally have to. And I think that's the blindness. It's, it's not necessarily always from a point of view of a hatred of women. Like I don't think necessarily Marlon James has misogynistic feelings. I think maybe he just hasn't been forced to consider the point of view of women um, as often. Maybe I'm speculating. I don't know this guy, but like, that's what it sounds like to me, you know, cause there's a way in which like Lisi Solo who like didn't raise well, they're not boy, well drawn. Um, sees this like, yeah, they're not well drawn. Like it, it, it almost feels a little stereotypical to be like, well, because she's his mom, obviously no matter what, she's gonna be like, he's gonna be king. And I'm like, I don't think that's true. I think there's a lot of mothers who could be like, nope, right? Like there's just, it's just that. There's just a certain amount of like, this seems like a shorthand for what women do, which I don't think is true. Uh, it's poor characterization. You know, it's, yeah. I would say the same thing about a male character who was ill-drawn, you mm -hmm. know, and these just happen to be female characters. And also, quite frankly, I found myself wondering if it's the, um, it's also kind of the, because this is almost a, this is a superhero world in a sense, mm -hmm. you know, this is, this is, even though it's not, it's this other world that we've never seen before. This is kind of the, the superhero, everyone's got powers and, and, and in that world, although the, even in superhero world, women have become much stronger characters. But this feels mm -hmm. almost like a, a fallback to an earlier era of, of superheroes where women could have powers too, but usually they use them for evil. You know, you had Catwoman, you know, back, way back when. Way the early yeah. Is ultimately were their own, um, created their own undoing. Mm -hmm. Even if they were supposed to be brilliant and cunning, ultimately at their core they were bad and they would somehow fall. And that's true of so, so it feels like yeah. a throwback. 
Yeah, yeah, and it feels like a throwback to another era era of super tele, superhero storytelling. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> actually that's actually interesting because Sogolan is killed essentially the first time. She's ultimately killed by Tracker, but the first time when she's dragged through the door, it's by a spirit that had um, who wanted revenge, and she had all these spirits who wanted revenge, right? That's why she always had all these protection runes. But the IS is doing the same thing, and IS is male, and IS is not undone by all the spirits that he is like betrayed. So you know, there's that. Um, so yeah. But so moving away, I feel like moving away from like the women uh, character issue, there was also a lot of characters that weren't human at all or weren't ever human. Like they're just like monsters. And I loved all these mythological creatures. They were so cool. Me too. <laughs> they were so cool. They were <laughs> so cool. And what I loved about it is that it was well researched. Like the Ipumdulu, Sasabonsam, Asambonsam. Uh, what was the troll people? I wrote it down. The Zogbanu, I believe. Oh my God, I can't remember. Yeah, Zogbanu, um, the Ipumdulu. Those are all actually taken from African folklore. That was the coolest thing. He didn't make all of them up. A lot of them are taken from yeah, folklore. Yeah, which I love. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> like just bringing this into the mainstream. Um, which I thought was genius. I, I yeah. loved that. Well, and I have to be honest, that's part of the reason I was excited to read the book, mm -hmm. because that's my kind of thing. Right. Like, I love mythology. I love monsters. I love other worlds, you know, and so I was excited to read this. And that part, those parts of the book were wonderful. You know, those, mm -hmm. those, there were those pops of, oh, wow, I didn't know this. You know, I didn't know these stories. Mm -hmm. I didn't know these creatures. And that discovery was fabulous. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I loved all that. Gerald, anything to add about the creatures? Uh, no, no. Just uh, agreeing with with both of you that 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 he uh, part of his skill, I think, is is as, as I mentioned earlier. You know, his, his various characters that he creates, and also the the non gendered the the creature characters are uh, a really sort of well drawn, quite. It's quite sort of visual. It's quite easy to visualize the, these these characters. Um, so he he does that very very well. Was, yeah, that was really good. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because his ability to describe things and to really paint a picture in your mind is a blessing and a curse. In this book's particular, well, all his books are apparently violent, but it's a blessing and a curse because it's like everything is so vivid, including yeah. the sexual violence. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, well. Um. Mm. Yeah. But he also creates a new continent, which I'll admit, when I first opened the book and I saw that map and I saw a list of characters, I was overwhelmed and I felt despair that I would learn this. But partway through, I felt like I learned it. By the time we got to the Malakal section, I felt like, oh, I get this world now, which is a feat in and of itself. Um, did you guys have that? Do you guys feel like you understand the lay of the land and how those worlds functions or not? No. No. But that's also something I resist as a reader, to be honest. Honest, and I resist as a writer, which is really bad. Um, so when I see something like, no, come away feeling as if I understood the geography, I also didn't feel as if, if it bothered me that I didn't mm -hmm. necessarily ex understand what the world, what the, let me put it this way I barely understand what our real world, how geography we all fit together that how poor my education was in that area that's probably why i'm not as interested so it didn't bother me that i didn't come away understanding what geographically the world looked like because i loved the way he used his descriptive powers in other ways i love that i could picture each setting he put me in i love that i could picture the characters i loved that the monsters were so vividly described so i took something else away from that Mm. Yeah, Gerald, you also said no to. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Because I, 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 I didn't want to be overwhelmed with too much de detail about where they were, about the land, um, and I don't, th and, and and the the cast of characters, and I don't think I lost out because I didn't understand the the the, the layout of 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 the the world that he'd built. Um, I think, and I think maybe because it was 
as as uh, Colette says, there's this circular narrative. So you 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 sort of have a, a an adventure, for want of a better word, within a particular area, and, and you came down, came back on itself, and then you move on to a different area. So so you didn't have a you know we have to get to that destination, that strong drive through this world because that's where you want to get to over there. Mm. Yeah. I, I I think I sort of just naturally started to learn. I was listening to the book a lot, especially on my commute. So periodically, having just learned a lot or listened to a lot of the book, I would just come back, open my physical book and look at the map again to reconfirm. Like So it was just maybe like four or five times I'd open the map and I'd be like, ah, that makes sense. How well, that was smart. Yeah. That, that's how I got the lay of the land. And um, I like that. I, I, you know, this, this, that's, you know, when you're writing a fantasy where you're creating a whole world from scratch, like there's people who like know Middle Earth, like the back of their hand, right? Like this has that potential. Um, if you, I actually, now that, that you say that, I wish I had done that. I think that would have been fun. I mm -hmm. think that would have just been interest, something that inter would be interesting for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I'm not going to read it again. <laughs> yeah. Like, for example, like when Sogolan's like, oh, I want safe passage to the Mweru in the lingo. Then I open up the book and I'm like, oh, it's like right next to the Mweru. Okay, that makes sense. Except no, because she didn't have the child in hand and it's dumb. But geographically, it makes sense. <laughs> Everything else does not. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I thought the world building was great. And the towns were very distinct. Every town you went to felt different from the last one, which was great. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So, um, moving on then to the pros, I'm like keeping my eye on the time. Uh, so we've talked a bit about how he played with language in a way that was interesting. Do either of you want to explain uh, what he did with language and why it was cool or not cool if you didn't like it? Yeah, he, he's he's the the way because there's a lot of dialogue in this book. Um, and yet it seemed as though for each character he, he had created a way of speaking which enabled you to to identify who was speaking pretty clearly uh, it's not all the time and, it, and it's very difficult to do that to get these sort of individual narrative voices the, the dialogue voices um but uh, i i think there's sometimes there's some clever bits and i it's 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 hard to do to 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 create clever writing that doesn't allow the author to intrude. So you wonder. So I think it, it's it's a sort of book that takes a little bit of getting used to, um, because you have to sort of roll with it. And 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 when when he does some of his sort of, I I I'd written a bit something down where it's, I said Yoda where where. You know that he'd got the the um, the the, the uh, um, yeah the subject the, of verb. the sentence backwards yeah yeah and and so I I sort of thought well that's, that's very clever um, and you, and you've just got to at the first time I read it I just thought oh that's strange did he mean to say that and um, but then you you get into it and and then you sort of roll with his his the different things that he does. So it, it makes it quite interesting and, 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 and sort of refreshing in a way. Um, but it, it, it is, there is a danger that you stop the, the, the narrative um, while the reader sort of gets to grip with, with what, what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Colette, did she freeze? Yes, I think so. Frozen. Yeah. Yeah. So in that same interview with Gia, he talks about how he studied um, the grammar of African languages and took a lot of notes on it to shape the way that he would construct sentences uh, for this book, which I think worked. And like you, in the beginning, it took me a while to learn it. But once I learned it, I felt like I was in a different, very specific, particular world. It felt vaguely African, even though I don't speak African languages and I've never yeah. been to Africa. But just from pulp culture, I was like, okay, I can feel that. <laughs> Which was cool. Um, mm. So, yeah, I loved all of that. Uh, and there was also, like, a limited vocabulary because it's being told uh, by Tracker, who is 
cunning, he's street smart, he's clever, but he's ultimately uneducated, right? He's not a very educated mm. person. So like everything is like sword, ax, bow, stick, swing, <laughs> hit, cut, right? Like everything is very yes. stilted, which makes sense. Like he's not a super educated person and he's speaking in a very particular way. Um, it's funny, I read a review online who was like, annoyed by that they're like oh he's supposed to be a master of writing action but everything is like hit him with a stick but it makes <laughs> sense for tracker yes i didn't mind yes. it as much as that review did yeah, yeah. this colette rejoined us yeah hey colette bandwidth issues yeah okay good just want to make sure there we go I, yeah just cut right out mm -hmm. sorry yeah. about that yeah so we were just talking about the language um uh, Gerald was saying how the dialogue, there's a lot of dialogue, but it was very distinct among characters. And I was saying how uh, in the interview with Gia, James talks about learning grammar from African languages, putting that sentence and structure in this book, and how it was very limited vocabulary because the story is being told by Tracker. You know, hit him with a stick. That was my favorite. Like, because, because I'm listening to the audio book, right? So I'm hearing the guy say very dramatically a very yeah. simple yeah. sentence. <laughs> yeah. That would make it, yeah, would make a difference, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to add anything about the pros, Colette, or are you good? I think she's frozen again. Yeah, I, I, I think there was, there, was, there was some part, I mean, the, the, I, I, you know, I started marking things in the book that uh, I no. either delighted yeah. me or irritated me and 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 delighted is, no. is two points no. and, and irritated is about I, 10. I, um, I feel like you guys so shall we get into the things that irritated us for is it me, time to go into the negative me, yeah. because i was sorry you kept cutting out she's struggling yeah yeah it's a shame that's okay i know Okay, there we go. Take down your bandwidth again, if you haven't. Now that you're back in. Frozen again. Yeah, she's frozen again. So. Um, yeah, there, there was there was some there was some delightful, and 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 funny things, and, and just a couple I marked. Um, where um, he says, right now your story has meat where you will not talk, bone where you do. What a sort of very clever way of of describing something, mm -hmm. of of you know the, somebody's telling you something, but they're not telling you the whole story. Um, I, I and uh, little things that lots of little things like that, and I thought, oh, that's that's very clever, and and it's probably you know, maybe it's picked up from from the. You know the African, the study of the African languages, perhaps, and the study of of the um, you know African stories. But but that's I just think uh, just just a, such a clever way of writing that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of like cool like proverb sounding things that were just really yes. clever. Yeah. Yes. So shall we pivot into the negative for our last like ten minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Only ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I did it that way intentionally or the whole episode could just be yes. ranting about the sexual yeah. violence. And to be clear, it's not that I don't want sexual violence in any of my writing. And I've said this in Slack several times. I keep comparing it in my head to last year when we read The Sympathizer because The Sympathizer has a very brutal, graphic, spare no details rape scene in it. Um, but it's towards the end after you know that the main character has some trauma that he has repressed and doesn't want to deal with and rape and violence exists in the story before that rape scene in the backdrop as a fact of war he's not shying away from the fact that war is dark that there is rape that there is murder that there is violence um but he doesn't dwell on it or give you gratuitous details until he gets to the scene that shaped the protagonist and explains why he made the choices that he made throughout the rest of the story. So it was effective, even though I sat there squirming, right? But in this one, 
every yeah. single rape is graphically told, you start to become numb to it. It just irritates you without having meaning. It starts to feel gratuitous. So, for example, the hyena rape scene, which is arguably the worst one, if that was the only one that had been gratuitously told as a way to explain um, trackers uh hatred of nika and the way that he is why he's so slow to trust people he always was but even more so um maybe even his hatred of women a little bit i don't know right like if it's a way to explain the psyche of tracker and that's the only one that's gratuitous it's more bearable than this just like constant gratuitous detail of sexual violence and i think the point where it really exploded for me and made me angry was when we're getting to the story of how Nika became an impumdulu, we've been reading gratuitous rape scenes for over 550 pages. And how did it happen? Rape again. Of course it did, right? Yeah. That's why it annoyed me. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, it, it, it's a strange thing is that I, I, I went for a walk earlier this afternoon and uh, I spoke to my partner about it. And, and she said, you know, do you have a problem with writers representing violence in in stories and I, I you know and, and you sort of have to think about you know am I, am I overreacting to this and and actually no i don't have a problem Vi as long as the violence and the sex and the violent sex and the rape has a point to to sort of it it, it there is a point to it um, mm. and, and like you're saying, the sympathizer, yes, there was one really graphic scene, which, you know, is quite sort of stomach churning and, and, and you think, whoa, but it's there for a reason. Whereas this, it just becomes, there is just so much of it. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and as we said in, in discussion before we went on air, you know, the, the obsession with, with the penis as, as, you know, everything has to come back to that. And, and you just think, why why is it is is he why is he doing this you know is he is is he there is there a point to it is 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 he trying to say this happens a lot in my world therefore i have to describe it i don't know it, it just it, and it then starts to take over your understanding of the story and and it and it then colors your understanding of the story and your enjoyment of the story because you like you said, oh, here we have, you know, another rape scene. And, and it's, and you just think there's too much of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think. Can I, is she back? That doesn't feel purposeful. Yeah. Oh, am I frozen or back? You're back, you're back. It's just delayed. I just got to pause longer. You're back. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, it, it does. It, Repetition without purpose is, is annoying as hell. It really is. It's it's mm. if show me why we need another rape scene. Show me how this yeah. moves the story along and develops this inner journey, the uh, antagonist or whatever it might be. But if you're just giving me rape scene after rape scene after rape scene without me feeling as if there's a purpose. I'm going to stop paying attention. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. there are going to be some people who are anesthetized to that, who are, you know, teenage boys who play lots of, you know, dark video games. Maybe they're just kind of used to that's part of the game. And I know that part of what James was playing with when he created the story was kind of playing with world building and that that mentality of, you know, brutal worlds and and how you do Coming in sort of you're cutting out a lot, but we'll get it on your recorded track. Uh yeah. Yeah, and you know. And then there was entire monstrous creatures. So, like, I think one thing that really encapsulates how gratuitous everything felt I is, um, cut out. yeah, you cut out. But it's on your track, so we'll get what you said. 
for the final edit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that really irritated me as well as the Ogo race as a concept, I liked sad Ogo, the character. So put that to the side, but Ogos, how are Ogos created? It's when a giant rapes a human woman, which all women apparently die from, except contradiction, the few that survive to give birth to Ogos who, by the way, they're going to die in childbirth because they're ripped open, very graphically described. Um, when the, when the Ogos are born, all the Ogos are male and all of them, except said Ogo apparently, are rapists. Like, okay, great. And then the Ipamdulu, how does he make Nika the Ipamdulu? Via rape. So you could think to yourself, maybe there's a commentary. Oh, and all the Ipamdulus are male. Okay. So you can think to yourself, maybe there's a commentary here about how monstrous rapists are and how the great preponderance of rapists are men. There are women rapists, but it clearly skewed in one direction. So there could be a commentary there, but then it gets kind of gross when even the victims are, that, that result from that rape are rapists, right? So the monstrous giant rapists give uh, who who produce offspring. So is it about the cycle? How rapists begave, beget rapists? I don't like that. I don't like the idea of just assuming like the offspring, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm trying to give some sense or reason to why the Ogo race exists. And it's just, brutally violent against women for no reason. Uh, and the only reason why we know Sad Ogo is a good guy is the same reason we know Tracker is a good guy. All good guys in this story save children from rape. So that's that's basically how you know. <sighs> I mean, really, the moral line here is do you rape or do you not rape? That's the moral line in this book. That's how you know who a good guy is. It's a very low bar. Yep. <laughs> a very low bar. Yeah. 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 It, that that really annoyed me. <sighs> yeah, and and the and the, and the greater issue with that is when you have so much rape and so much gross stuff, it starts to become a joke in, into itself. So I had ranted about this book, the sexual violence specifically to my boyfriend, and then I said, oh, late in the book, you figure out how Femeli was controlling the leopard via poison. And I said, guess how it was happening? And he goes, butthole? Of course it's butthole. It's always going to be butthole. We're reading Black Leopard, Red Wolf. That's not good. You don't want your book no. to be the answer to everything is through the butt or the penis. <laughs> like, come on. <sighs> yeah, it's, it's funny when I was, I was describing part of the book to my partner. And I said, as an example, and, and I described it, it, there's a part in the book there. And then it, it involves a corn cob. And, and she said... I can't get that image out of my head now. I said, no, it's, you know, why? Why? It, it, it's so graphic. And I mean, it, perhaps in a way it's it's good writing because the image is there, bang, and it's it's not going to leave you. But but actually it's it's not a good image that you want to have. It, it's not. Oh, yeah. I don't know. And, and again. And, yeah, you're right. You, yeah, you, you, you're right, I mean, it's that you it's then starts to become not funny but 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 the 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 seriousness of of rape begins to have it have its edges roughed um smoothed off and you think oh yeah it's it's another one of these so so you you do wonder whether whether you you're losing something and it loses it it's 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 you know the graphic violence and and the horror of rape because it happens so often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Were you yeah. gonna say something yeah. to that? There you go. No, I was. I was laughing because it's that ugh, overwhelming. Yeah. God, why? Mm -hmm. You know the the whole overwhelming nature of anesthetizing us to something I don't want to be anesthetized to. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want too much rape. I just yeah. don't, yeah. You, you know, we keep referring to the sympathizer, but yeah, one, that one violent scene justified itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. These don't. And these also underscore. So going back to the example of Nika becoming a Nipumdulu, how he became a Nipumdulu, saving the woman he loved, saying, take me instead of her. There is a certain level of redemption. There is a lot of beauty in that. They're a real couple. It's somebody who we thought was a monster who's showing real love. All of that 
is now being papered over by a needless rape scene. That's graphic. Why? Like, yeah. Like, all the beautiful stuff that's happening around Nika towards the end of the story is coming undone by this rape scene. And the other part that makes it um, over the top is in a society where almost all men are rapists, almost all men are wife beaters, everyone is basically the worst. Do I really care who's king? Do I really think there's a difference between the Kwashdara and a vampire king? I don't want, like, it's a society that is so dark where everyone's bad. Like, it's not even like the side characters, what we call in video game, the NPCs, like the backgrounds characters. It's yeah. not like any of them are leading moral lives and just like, want to raise a family on a farm. No, they're all like wife beating child rapists too. So if everyone is a wife beating child rapist slave owner, then I don't care about the society. I do, I'm not rooting for any one faction to win out over the next. Who's going to rule on this dark pile of turds? I don't know. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that's what happens when you make it too dark. Well, exactly. Because I've, yeah. I always say I don't need to like the characters, but I need to empathize with them. I need to understand them as yeah. complex beings. And that's not how I felt about most of these characters. They're just, yeah, it's like there's nobody to root for. There's no reason why I, you're exactly right. I hadn't thought about it that way. But yeah, there is no reason for me to care about who's going to be king. Yeah, ever. And Let it be anybody. It literally doesn't matter. Everyone here, like there is no good people in this world. Great. Like very few and far between. Basufu Manguru, who is dead, was one of the few. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. So, and then, you know, we were saying, when you do so much of it, one, we become desensitized to all the rape. It doesn't start to matter as much, but it papers over the stuff that is beautiful. Two, I don't care about the society because it's too dark. And three, the part where it becomes like too jokey. Remember that scene where the woman whose husband is beating her wants Sadogo to kill her husband? And he's going to do it. But she, for whatever reasons, like, I'm going to make it worth your while, which he wasn't asking for. And the worth her while is a hand job. But because he's a giant, she has to use two hands. So, again, giant penis. She has to use two hands to give him a hand job. And then when he ejaculates, it hits her and sends her flying against the wall. This reads like a teenage boy's power sex fantasy. Are you kidding me? What a gratuitous scene. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. And e even in another world... It's ridiculous. It's rid yeah, no matter what, it's just yeah. silly. It's just silly. Like, why do you have to have a scene where a woman's being sent against the wall by ejaculate? Like, really? Ugh. Oh my god! I, I, at one point, I did wonder whether, whether, whether trying to sort of uh, try to draw parallels with an animal world because you do have these the the, the two, two main characters are are you know wolf and leopard and and there's a hyena and and you have these other creatures as well so maybe he's trying to sort of mix a human world with an animal world where where in the animal world this the, a lot of this happens but i uh, i don't know I, I i was trying to excuse it yeah no because the of... leopard's constantly saying humans do things that even animals don't do constantly the leopard's always saying that so no yeah. <laughs> that's so true no yeah <laughs> anyway we can end up there. I'm glad yeah. we left the negative for last because I can keep these rants going for a long time because oh, there is you, such a good could. story beneath this. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Yeah. 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 You did well to, to yeah point us in that direction. Yeah. yeah. There is a good story beneath <sighs> this oppressive layer of darkness that is simultaneously too much and silly. Like, yeah. Ugh. And, just to, to hearken back to something Gerald said in the beginning, which is a, a, an extremely valid point, I feel as if, you're right, once you win something like the man Booker, nobody edits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel as if an editor had more aggressively, if someone had more aggressively said, you have these issues in this book that could be brilliant, let's address yeah. them. Mm -hmm. It would have been brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, okay. Well, <laughs> we'll wrap it up here. We have another podcast to record yeah. the weekly. So, yeah. But thank you guys for sticking through because we had a hard yeah. time. 
This book, yes. was, we were supposed to have this discussion months ago, like two months ago, and we dragged yeah. our feet because we couldn't get past all of this and forcing ourselves to, I think was a good exercise. I think yeah. you're right. Yeah. Okay. I, I think so, it would have been very easy just to, just to postpone the, the podcast completely and say, look, it's too difficult. It, it's, it's, it's not a good book. We're having too many problems and, and let's not do it. But, but you, I think you have to address, you have to address what you don't like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. So next month we're reading The Bridegroom Was a Dog by Yoko Tawada. I'm nervous again. So let me start with the good news. The good news is it's only 64 pages long. So it's going to be very quick. Here's the bad news. So given the reception to Black Leopard Red Wolf, the way that it's like, oh, it's an African Game of Thrones. I thought, oh, this is going to be something commercial, easy, fun. And then I'm going to break that up with something difficult and weird. Well, joke's on me. Oh. Yeah, so The Bridegroom Was a Dog is supposed to be, it's described as like bizarre, but funny. I don't think it's necessarily violent, but one review on Amazon said there's a lot of snot. So maybe like mildly gross. Um, <laughs> because if there was something worse than snot, that reviewer would have pointed that thing out, right? So if snot's the worst of it, there we go. We're fine. We're fine. Uh, but yeah, so it's supposed to be kind of bizarre, surreal. Um, it doesn't follow a normal timeline, but it's only 64 pages. See, I thought we were going to go from something fun, direct, accessible, and commercial to something weird, but I was wrong. All right. <laughs> <laughs> weird begins weird. Yeah. So as you read The Bridegroom Was a Dog by Yoko Tawada, let us know your thoughts on Twitter with the hashtag LRH Book Club or join a discussion group on Facebook, The Literary Roadhouse Readers. A link is provided in the show notes. Migrate your way over to iTunes, Stitcher, or Spreaker and leave a review. It helps a lot. Also, so as you can, as you have heard, this story has turned me into a Puritan ranter. Uh, so support my profitizing and our podcast expenses at patreon.com slash literary roadhouse. Every bit helps. All right. Thank you guys both for sticking through this discussion. Thank, Thank you. you for making us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did make you true. <laughs> Yo, I'm so glad you did. Yeah, I really am. I'm like, we're doing right, it, thanks, guys. guys. Yep. Right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>